had Olivia put in a whole bunch of scriptures this morning. I was going to preach this morning on a, again, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, but I woke up about probably three o'clock one, one morning. And again, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision, but I could just help, I could hear the words, follow John, follow John. Well, I, I knew, and it, it, it did not. I, I knew that was coming. I knew that. It's not so bad, Brother John. Not so bad. If you follow Christ, we'll follow you. But I had that, um, again, I don't know if it was a dream or vision, but it said, follow John, follow John. So what I do a lot of times when I can't sleep, I'll lay down and pray a while, then I'll turn the TV on to some of you may recognize Daystar. And what it does about 3 o'clock in the morning, 3 to 5 o'clock in the morning, what they do, they play beautiful, soft Christian music, and then they got beautiful scenery in the background, and they show scriptures. That's all they do. They just show scripture. So I'll lay there and I'll read the scriptures. As the scriptures coming up, looking at the beautiful creation that God has made, they show Sedona, Arizona, with all the red rocks and uh, I mean beautiful red mountains, and they just show all kind of beautiful scenery that maybe some of us will never get to go to some of these places in Hawaii and all that. But they show all these beautiful sceneries that God has made, and then they put scriptures up there. So I'll lay awake and I'll I'll read the scriptures, and God will usually give me some some things out of the scriptures and I'll write them down. Well, this morning about 3 o'clock, that morning about 3 o'clock, again, I was awakened by those words, follow John. <laughs> so I laid there and prayed a while, then I turned the TV on, and the second scripture that came on was about St. John 10 and 10. And then I knew what the Lord was talking about then, follow John, so He wanted me to get into those, those scriptures. But I'm not going to do that this morning, but later on I'm going to be getting into that. But this morning as the service progressed, the Lord kind of unctioned me to change this. We're going to go to Second Chronicles 20 and begin reading at the 13th verse. Because what we're going to do today, we're going to see what I've been talking about how important it is for the musicians and the singers to, to be in alignment with the Spirit of God mm -hmm. so that the Spirit of God can function and the Spirit of God can flow through us as the Spirit of God wants to mm -hmm. flow through us. And again, we saw that demonstration. <coughs> you know, it will cause people to come down to the altars. I mean, when you get anointed singing, and, and this is what the Word of God says, and all of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones. I love this part. They all stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. There's a lot of people ought to be in the house of God this morning with their little ones, their wives, and their children. You know, because this is what they need to do. And they stood before the Lord. Because if there's ever a time that we need to teach our little ones that... You know, bring them into the house of God so that they can hear the Word of God and train them up in the way that they should go. So this is what all Judah did. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benani, the son of Jeel, the son of Matiadah, a, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord. In other words... <coughs> Just like the preacher stands up and starts preaching and the Spirit of God began to move upon him. This is what happened to the man of God. The Spirit of the Lord came upon the man of God in the midst of the congregation as we are this morning. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah. In other words, pay attention. Pay attention. Get your minds off everything as it's on right now. Get your mind on what I'm fixing to say to you. This is what the man of God has said. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid. And he was even speaking unto the king, Jehoshaphat. And he said, thus saith the Lord, be thou not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of the great multitude. And, and if you look at the situation here, a great multitude had encamped 
against the children of Israel to destroy them. And he said, I don't want you to be dismayed by the great multitude that has come against you because the multitude is definitely bigger and, and more in number than you are. How many of you ever come to a situation in your life when it seems like the troubles and the trials and the heartaches and pain, it just outnumbers everything. It just outnumbers everything. Amen. But he said, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Somebody say, the battle is not mine. I give it to you. The battle is not yours. It doesn't say that there's not going to be a battle. It doesn't say that there's not going to be a fight. But what it is actually saying is, you have to give the battle to the Lord. Amen. You have to give the fight to the Lord. Because I can tell all of us, there's not one standing here or sitting here today that can combat the devil with your own power and your own strength and come out a winner. Amen. You're going to come out a loser every time. Because the, the devil knows every strategy. He knows every tactic. He knows every trick in the book. He's dealt with people like you. He's dealt with people like me in the past. And he knows every trick in the book. So you're not going to win. The battle is going to be too great. Because the multitude is just too much for you to handle on your own. We're living in a time church. Where it seems like you hear me say this all the time. If it's not one thing, it's another. One thing upon another. One thing upon another. One thing doesn't leave before something else piles upon it. Uh, and you think you hear people say, I don't know if I could take one more thing. I don't know if I could handle anything else. Well, that's when the situation arises where the multitude is just too great and it outnumbers you. But you've got to always keep in mind the battle is not yours. You can't fight this battle on your own. You've got to give it to Him. Give it to Him. Tomorrow, now then He gives them instruction. Tomorrow go you down against them. He didn't say go right now. He said go tomorrow. You know, God has specifics. If you listen to the Spirit of God and you listen to the presence of God, a lot of time when I'm preaching a message, I think that I want to do it one kind of way, but God got specifics. He wants to do it a certain way. I got a certain message that I want to preach, but He has a message that He wants to preach. So you may want to go down today, but He's saying don't try to go down today. Wait till tomorrow. Okay? Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. He's telling them, because you see, they don't really know where they're coming from. You see? How many know God has an all-seeing eye? He can see where the enemy's coming from when you don't know where the enemy's coming from. God can see where the enemy's already coming from. And He'll give you warning of where the enemy's going to come. So He says, they're coming up from the cliff of Ziz. They're not coming up from any cliff. So you'll focus your attention on this cliff and you'll focus your attention on this cliff. But you're going to miss it because they're coming from the cliff of Ziz. That's the direction that they're coming from. God knows exactly what direction your, your enemy's coming from. Whether it's going to be sickness, whether it's going to be finances, or whether it's going to be family problems, God already knows where your enemy's going to approach you. Even before your enemy gets to you, God already knows where they're coming from. He knows the direction. So what you got to do, you got to listen to His direction. Don't try to go out and say, well, I'm going to go, I think they're going to come from this cliff. No. They're coming from the cliff of Ziz. It's specific. God knows exactly what you're going to encounter. And you shall find them at the end of the brook. Isn't that specific? I mean, how specific can you possibly get? Not only are they coming from the cliff of Ziz, but you're going to find them and you're going to encounter them at the edge of the brook. End of the brook. Before the wilderness of Juria, there's three specific things that God has instructed them where the enemy is going to come from and where the enemy is going to confront them. He's already, 
let me tell you, <laughs> nothing will come upon you. If you listen to the Spirit of God, nothing's going to come upon you except the Spirit of God has already made a way of escape for you. If you listen to His Spirit, if you listen to the voice of His Spirit, and don't try to fight your battle on your own. Don't try to handle the situation on your own because I'm going to tell you what, you're going to go to the wrong cliff. You're going to go to the wrong brook. And you're going to go to the wrong wilderness. But God will direct you and tell you exactly what you need to do. You see. You shall not. You shall not need to fight in this battle. In other words, you're not even going to fight. Set yourselves. Stand still. I mean, if you feel like you've got to be doing something. You've got to, you've got to handle it. I've got to handle this situation. You know, if I don't handle it, it's not going to get done. Well, sometimes the Lord just wants you to stay out of the battle and just let Him do the fighting for you. Yes. How many know He's a better fighter than you are? Yes. Because He has that all-seeing eye. And I'm going to tell you what, He's got weapons and He's got artillery that we don't have. That He can use against the enemy. How many know God's ways is above our ways and His understanding is above our understanding? That's artillery that God has that we don't have because we're, we're, we're limited. We're limited. How many know God has no limits? So when we go against the enemy, you'll quickly run out of ammunition, but He'll never run out. So let Him fight your battles for you. So sometimes you just got to stand still. And see what? See the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not. Because what's going to happen? Fear, he's trying to tell them more than one time. Fear is trying to grip your heart. Yes. Fear is trying to grip. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, this has happened. That's happening. What are you going to do? Fear not. No be dismayed. But he said, tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Amen. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants, I love their attitude. You know, I've been talking to you a lot about attitude. God looks at attitude. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What did he hate about Esau? He didn't hate Esau's soul. He hated Esau. Read about it. He hated Esau's attitude. He hated Esau's attitude. And, and I love the attitude of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head. Because, you know, there still has to be reverence before God. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head. There's a world today and there's a society today that no longer reverences God. But we still need to reverence God. Yes. And all of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Goathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord. Now how are they fighting? Y'all notice they're not fighting with swords and shields. Right? They're fighting with humility. First it started out with, understand this church, you don't get up and sing without a spirit of humility. You don't play music without a spirit of humility. You don't preach without a spirit of humility. If, first, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. Y'all notice, and again, I'm seeing all this right as I'm preaching to you today. I didn't see a lot of this stuff before. But it started out before they started even worshiping and before they even started praising. They, and before they started singing, you'll find out later on, they first started out that they bowed their face and I'm going to tell you what, you know, and again, it's not so much the position of the body, but it's talking about the position of the heart. Amen. You can actually bow your face to the ground while you're standing up. It's the position of the heart. So what happened, and this is the Old Testament, so it gets very literal. How many understand the Old Testament gets very literal? So they actually bow their face 
It went as far down as it could possibly go in humility. They bowed their face. They didn't do like this and hold their heads up. No, they bowed their face to the ground. You remember reading in the Bible where there was a publican in the center that were praying? Y'all remember reading the story? And I, I preached about that. The publican, the sinner, was praying. Now the publican started telling God all of his... He been get, began to give God his resume and how good he was and all what he did. But you know what the Bible says about that sinner? He would not even lift up his head. He would not even lift up his head. I'm going to tell y'all, church, we've got to have a humble attitude. <laughs> If you do not have a humble attitude, I don't mind coming and seeing people, I don't mind seeing people run down to this altar and bow their knees before God. You might say, well, Brother Alvin, I'd do that, but someone would think I'm a sinner. You're not much worried about what you think somebody else thinks, but what you're worried about is your attitude toward Him. Because God looks unto Him that is of a what? A broken and a contrite spirit. And until your spirit gets broken and you get contrite and sorrowful before God, you are not a vessel that God can even work with. You have to have a broken and a contrite spirit before the Lord. So again, I don't mind seeing people come. A lot of people will again say, well, I'm afraid what somebody may think about me. Well, you know what? I'm not going to stand before them individuals on Judgment Day. I'm going to stand before Him on Judgment Day. So I want to make sure. And that's why David had a heart after God's own heart. He didn't care what other people thought about him. But he said, search me, O God. See if there's any wicked way in me. So this is what we got to do. First of all, they humbled themselves and they bowed their face <coughs> to the ground. You can't take the second step without taking the first step. You can't really worship. You can't really worship and bring God glory and bring God honor unless you first bow your... And again, this is literal because this is Old Testament. But actually, what it's talking about is we have to bow our hearts. I mean, we have to get as low. And what, what you're doing is you're bowing your face to the ground because you're getting yourself in the position where you need to be because He's high and lifted up. And we're not high and lifted up. If I preach a good message and someone says, boy, that was a good message, I'm never going to get the big head. Or if you sing a song and someone says, boy, that was a man, you sure got it going in that song. We realize it wasn't me, but it was him that did it. We realize our position. That's why David again had a heart after God's own heart. Because David said, help me to know how weak and frail I really am. Always let me know what my position is. Because when I am weak, then I am made strong. When I humble myself before Him, that's where I'm going to get my strength. Is with a spirit of humility. Amen. Stay humble, church. Don't get a cocky attitude. Stay humble before God. God can't work with a cocky, exalted attitude. He says, if you humble yourself before me and you be a base, then I will exalt you. Amen. But you let him do it. Okay, and the Levites and the children of Kohath, Kohathites and the children of Korahites stood up to praise. Okay, what did they do then? After they humbled themselves, what was, what was the next step? They stood up. They were down. It showed the position they were in. You've got to be in the down position before you can get into the up position. You can't just start coming to church and say, well, I'm saved. No. What does the Bible say? Before you can even get saved, you've got to do what? Humble yourself as a little child before God. Humble yourself as a... Go down to the lowest degree of a little child. Leave all that adulthood, manhood, leave all that behind. You're not the macho man. You're not the, you're not the caretaker. You're not the giver. At this point, you're the receiver. How many knows it's a, it's a tough thing for a man to accept, to come into the position 
to receive and to accept. But we have to. You've got to realize you're not the giver. You're the receiver. And until you ever get to that point where you can humble yourself as a little child, you'll never really be able to stand up and praise God like God deserves to be prayed. Your praise is going to be empty unless you first went down and then you get up. You see those little, little things like this is important. They stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness because God had said tomorrow, so they wasn't going to wait till 12 o'clock and get up at 12 o'clock and, well, it's, it's, you know, it's still morning. No, they rose up early. They rose up early because the God had said go tomorrow and I believe as soon as they were able to, they got up that morning and they went forth into the wilderness of Tikio and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness. Okay, before he consulted singers, before he consulted, before he got singers to come, what did they do? First of all, they had bowed down. Then they stood up and they praised the Lord. And then he said, now is the time to appoint singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness. That they should do what? What is the purpose of singing and playing music? To praise the beauty of holiness. It's not for our beautiful voices. That's not why we're singing. That's not what's motivating us. That's not what's causing us to do what we're doing. But we want to praise the beauty of holiness. You can never praise the beauty of holiness in the manner that holiness needs to be praised. And how many know who's holy? How many knows who's holy? He's holy. Okay, so we can't praise Him to the degree that He needs to be praised unless we first go through the steps of bowing ourselves and humbling ourselves before God, putting our face to the ground, so to speak, then standing up and giving Him praise and giving Him glory. Musicians and singers, this is our responsibility. We haven't come to entertain people. We haven't come to make their flesh feel good. But what singing and music is all about is to praise the beauty of holiness. So you see, when we sing, what needs to be done? It needs to be sung under the anointing, under the anointing of God, not with just a pretty voice, because a pretty voice does nothing for God. You can have a pretty voice and still sing and your singing be empty. But what I wanted to do is show you the demonstration of what anointed singing and anointed music will do and how that it activated the presence of God. And people began to come down to the altar and, and people began to praise God. And maybe even more of you felt unction to come to the altar. But you let the devil talk you out of it. Because you were worried about what somebody else may think about you. But there were those that were not afraid to come to the altar as the anointed singing and anointed music was going forth. So what I'm saying to you before, and I'm teaching this to the, to the choir and to the musician, before we get up there to sing, now we started praying before we do it. The reason we're doing this is because we're, un, un, we're humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. And again, David said, help me to know how frail and weak I really am. And realize I can't do this on my own. Every time I stand behind the pulpit to preach, I'm very humble before God. I might say, well, you don't look very humble, but you can't see my heart. You see? You might look at the way I'm acting, the way I'm talking, you might think, well, he's pretty confident. No, believe me, I have no confidence in this flesh whatsoever. But I got confidence in the anointing of God. 
And when God tells me to change a message, I'm not going to say, well, I already got that. I'm going to go ahead and preach that. I can make a mess of things, even though it's the Word of God. It may not be. You see, because the enemy may be, the enemy may be, I'm sorry, the enemy may be coming from the cliff of Zeer. And I want to go and attack another cliff because I'm thinking this is where the problem lies. But you see, and they may be at the end of another brook, at the brook, and I may try to go to another brook. And I may go to another wilderness, you see. And even though it could be a possibility that that would be where the enemy is, God knows specific where the enemy is approaching. Because God knows the needs. Why? Because God searches the hearts. I don't have the ability to search your heart, but God has the ability to search our heart. So that's why I always, you know, of, of late, God has told me to get the musicians to come. And if there's anything in our hearts that should not be, you cannot really, really operate in the Spirit of God the way you need to operate and function and, and go against the enemy until you've went through those first steps. And then you can go against the enemy. So what happened? That they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. How, where, where, was, where, where were they at? They were before the army. You see what I'm saying? Singing and anointed music has the ability. David used to play the harp and drive the evil spirits away from Saul. So we have to. And what we have to learn to do as we come and we begin to play music and we begin to sing... We have to make sure everything is under the blood. We have to captivate our thoughts and bring everything into, into captivity. Cast down imaginations and images that are there that would kind of disrupt us and, 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 and hinder us from really performing the way that God wants us to perform. Because you see, God wants to do a specific work. And to say, praise the Lord for His mercy endure forever. Now, congregation, you may be sitting out there and you might say, well, what's my part in this? Well, y'all noticed before that all of Judah, they worshiped and they praised God. So there's a part that you play in this as well. And to say, praise the Lord. And when they began to sing, okay, everybody saying when they began to sing and to praise. That was not only the singers that was it was that were praising. It was the, the whole congregation was praising. You see, you don't you don't just leave it up to the singers and say, "Boy, they sure couldn't get it going this morning." Yeah. Well, maybe God might unction one of you to get a Jericho march going. Go ahead. You know, don't just wait for you might say, well, and they may be battling it. It, it may not be because that there's something wrong with their heart. It may be that the enemy is so great. And the enemy out, outnumbers them. So they may be needing the congregation to praise as well. So you from the congregation, don't sit there and say, well, bless God, they sure didn't get it going this morning. Well, what did you do about it? You know, what did you do about it? Why don't you just stand up and just start praising the Lord and, and start glorifying the Lord and start... I've seen people come up to the front when it was like a battle going on and a struggle going on, I've seen them kind of march up to the front. You might say, well, they can praise God in the Bible. They were just showing the devil, hey, if i got to get up into the front, I want to praise God and I want to glorify God. So whatever it takes to break this bondage, whatever it takes to get this going, I'm a willing vessel in your hands, oh God. <laughs> So what happened when they began to sing and to praise? What happened? They did not pick up one weapon. You know what their weapon was? Their weapon was worship and praise and singing. That's what their weapons were. Sometimes we don't realize the value. We sit and wait for the preacher to preach. But how many knows that the Lord already moved in this service even before I preached? The Lord had already moved in this service. 
The Lord had already touched heart in this service because of anointed singing, anointed music, and anointed praise. I'm not leaving you out. Anointed praise. Then what happened? The Lord set ambushments, ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. It took the preacher standing up and preaching. No, I'm telling you, church. There's anointed. Because you see, every song that is sung comes from inspiration. Anointed singing comes from inspiration. Anointed songs are not songs that are meant to tickle the flesh and make the flesh feel good and entertain. Anointed songs are reaching for the soul. Anointed songs are reaching for that eternal part. Anointed songs are reaching for that inner man that is inside of you. Because if that inner man can get strengthened, it's going to take care of that outward man. So when we sing anointed songs, that's why I pray. You know, songs that be sang, let them, let them be unctioned by God to sing those songs. Not songs that just sound pretty, but songs that will stir the heart. So when they began to sing and they began to praise the Lord and they began to worship, the Lord set ambushments against. And I'm going to tell you, church, individually speaking, individually speaking, we're not always assembled together in the house of God when you're facing the enemy, right? I want you to get this part. We're not always... But when you feel like you're fighting the enemy, and when all hell has come against you, if you can't sing, put in some music of somebody that can sing. Oh, let me tell you, when you're out there in the woods by yourself, understand that God really, you know, you know I'll tell you this, I, I reckon God's tone deaf when it comes down to what it sounds like. We're not. We're not. Because, you know, we're still in the natural body. But if you're singing from the heart and you sound like a frog croaking, it doesn't matter to God. I, I guarantee you, to God, it's music to His ears. Now, it may not be music to our ears because we're still in this old natural body. And we really don't want to hear people sounding like frogs or croaking. But when you're out there crawfishing by yourself or you're in the back, back a shower taking, my brother John, when you're in the shower taking, you can just let it go. I mean, just sing. Praise is unto God. Just let it go. You see? And you know what you can do? First of all, humble yourself before God first. Humble yourself before you do anything. Take the right steps. Approach God. Approach God with the attitude of humility. And then, when you stand up, and you start praising, and you start singing, I mean, you may have all of the enemy coming against you and you say, I don't know how I'm going to be able to make it. I don't know if my mind can take anything else. Right. But when you turn on that anointed music, again, David used to play his harp and drive evil spirits away from Saul. Saul couldn't do it himself. Right. So he, he played, you know, David used to play and drive them away from Saul. So get some anointed singing, and, you know, CD or whatever, and put that CD in or just lift up your voice and begin to praise God. And I guarantee you, the Lord will set ambushments against the enemy. And it won't be anything that you do. Because so many times we feel like we've got to do it. I've got to put my hand into it. I've got to work this situation out. I've got to take care of this situation. But we'll find out if we follow those steps that the Lord will set ambushments. What is an ambushment? The devil don't. The devil didn't know what hit him. That's what an ambushment is. Just in simple, simple layman terms, the devil didn't know what hit him when he when he was ambushed. I mean, it just came. What is an ambushment? It comes from a direction you're not expecting it to come from. Let me tell you. The devil knows how you operate. And he's expecting you to operate a certain way. But when you start operating under the anointing and the Spirit of God, 
That's one place the devil cannot follow. There is a path that no fowl knoweth, and the vulture's eye has never seen. The devil knows us. He knows exactly how we operate. He knows exactly how we move. But an ambushment is something that comes from a direction he is not expecting it to come from. You know. So in, instead of handling it the same way you always handle things, just start singing. And again, humble yourself before God. And start praising God and singing and worshiping God. And you know what? You might say, well, I know exactly what they're going to do, exactly what they're going to operate, how they're going to operate. But then all of a sudden, you just start singing. You just start singing before God. Instead of even getting on your knees sometimes and, oh God, help me. Take care of, you know, do this, God, do that, God, I need this. And, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with prayer in that manner. But I'm telling you, there are times you can actually praise your way out of your problems. Yeah. You can act, because you see, there's no just one way to do things. Here again, you'll find and you read certain scriptures, sometimes they face the enemy head on. And David took, you know, a stone and a slingshot and he hit Goliath with the stone. That was one way of approach. And you'll find other ways that they approached the enemy and they went at the enemy with swords and spears. But David said, I don't come at you in the normal way with a sword and a spear, because if I did, you would beat me down. But I come at you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And He told me to get this smooth stone and put it in this slingshot. And you see, that was not the normal way of doing things. And some of you got a certain way that you handle things every time. Every time something, oh God, help me, please help me God. And again, there's nothing wrong at times doing it that way. Because again, there is no set pattern. But there are going to be times when you really want to ambush the devil and you want to get him from a direction he's not expecting because he knows how we operate. He knows what gets us down. And, and here's what happens. And you, you, I think you will understand that. If you're not careful, you'll get into a form of godliness. And, and you may not believe this, but prayer can actually be a form of godliness. You may not believe this. And, and don't, don't get me wrong and say that Brother Ralph is putting down on prayer. I would never put down on prayer because the effectual fervent prayer, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. But how many knows prayer can become a routine? Prayer can become just a form if you're not careful. And you go through the same old motions. And when the Lord was teaching, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And He taught them how to pray. He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. You know, hallowed be Thy name. I put myself down in a low position. I exalt You. He just he taught them the manner in which you ought to pray. He didn't tell them to say the Lord's Prayer every time that they got down to pray to go through that form and ritual. He just taught them the pattern of how to pray. So if we're not careful, our praise can become a ritual. How many of you have found, ever found your hands lifted up without your heart being lifted up? Y'all getting this? Yes. Have you ever found your hands being lifted up without your heart being lifted up? But you've got to lift up your hands with your heart. Why? Because it gets to be a form and it gets to be a ritual. The same way with singing. How many of us singers have ever got up there and we've sung, but our heart really wasn't in it? Our musicians got up there to play, but we played with our hands. And the Bible says you'll give me your mouth and you'll give me your lips, but your heart is not in it. So we have to be careful that we don't get ritualistic <coughs> and we don't go through a routine of the way. We put, you, can be care, you better be careful. We put down certain religions because they're so ritualistic and they go through these routines of saying things and doing things and we'll put down on them. But if we're not careful, we'll follow that same pattern. 
But here's what the Spirit of the Lord will do. And he said the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehoshaphat and told him what to do. Let the Spirit of the Lord direct you. There's going to be times you get down on your knees and you travail. There's going to be times you get down on your knees and you bombard heaven and you travail like Jesus did until your sweat became come as great drops of blood. Then there's going to be other times that the Spirit, of God, the Spirit of the Lord is going to say to you, I want you to set ambushments against the enemy. He's expecting you to operate a certain way. But here's what i got planned for you to do. You just fall down on your knees before me. Humble yourself first before me. Stand up and just start praising God and you're going to catch the devil completely off guard. He's not going to know what direction and he's not going to know how to handle you when you do it in that manner. Because we don't act in that routine, ritualistic manner. So what do we do, Brother Ralph? We just let the Spirit of the Lord lead and guide us. So, singers and musicians, I said this to you today because we saw a demonstration this morning of what God does when you have anointed music and when you have anointed singing and it goes forth and ministers to the hearts of the people. Now, how many of you congregation, maybe you can't sing, and maybe you say, I kind of feel left out, but how many of you still can know you can still worship? You can still worship, and you can still praise God. And worship includes dancing before the Lord. Worship includes raising your hand and praising the Lord. If you feel like, hey, I'm going to get out there and just march around the church. I don't care what you feel like you got, just as long as you're worshiping God. Won't you lift your hands and praise Him? Give Him glory and give Him honor. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's set ambushments against the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.